Hey, it's BT with Tales from a Gemini. My guest is Leslie Reyes. She wrote the book, The Zen of Learning to Ride a Motorcycle. Uh, it actually deals with uh, mental health and her struggles, uh, dealing with a, a schizophrenic mother, and that's just the beginning of it. I mean, she came through the other side smiling, so if she can do it, you can do it. We get into it, and uh, but all with smiles, and, and it's a good time. So if you get a chance, check out this episode. I guarantee you'll like it. Check out Leslie Reyes. Okay. Hey, it's BT with Tales from a Gemini, and I have a guest today. And let me tell you something, man. I am so damn excited. Oh, I'm excited for all my guests. Why I say that? But this one, I don't know. This one, <laughs> had a little, this one had a little different because, I mean, just because, I mean, of course, she got me with the title of her book, The Zen of Learning to Ride a Motorcycle. And uh, of course, that got me. But then this book was so much more than this. It, it tricked me, but in a good way. Because it oh. talked about her struggles with mental health and, man, what she went through. And I do mean, wow. It was a wow book and it wakes you up. But I love how she blended mental health and motorcycles together. And <laughs> my wonderful, beautiful guest, Miss Leslie Reyes. How are you, Leslie? I'm doing great. How are you, my fellow Gemini? <laughs> oh, man, we are Geminis together. That means we are trouble. We're TNT, baby. We're down to Mike. But you know what that means? That means we are the life of the party, and people love us, but only, like, when we're there. And after we leave, they're like, what happened to them? And we're just, we're just leave. But we're the life yeah. of the party. Yeah. We great. can see both sides of the story. But I isn't think that that's great, though? That's what, that people yeah. love. That's, a, that's the great thing about a Gemini. It's like, I, I, I literally can listen to your side of the story, no matter how wrong you may be, and go, you know what? Interesting point. And then I really go, interesting point. And then I'll leave. I mean, that's just how yeah. I yeah. Right, what's, so what's your twin? What's your twin? What are your twin personality, your dual personality? Oh, gosh. Yeah. They don't always get along because one of them's a little more wild and one of them's like, calm down. Like, come on. One of them wants to be grounded. I swear I did this like hypnotherapy thing once. It was it was for like anxiety. It was supposed to and it was about integrating the two sides of yourself because I feel like anxiety is sort of we're we're kind of feeling split. Right. right. Of course. So the Gemini, that's why Geminis are always really anxious, anxious. And and what what I saw was like there was one side of me that was like a nun, but she was like a nun that trained Rottweilers. And then there was just like this other other side of me that was just like a crazy ballerina that wants to go to Burning Man, you know, like. <laughs> so you're like the Rottweiler Whisperer. Or the the Rottweiler Whisperer whisper on one side, but then like, you know, just woo, you know, it's an air sign. So we're just sort of floating around, right? <laughs> well, it's kind of funny you mentioned that Burning Man because I because throughout the whole, reading your whole book, and mm -hmm. I love how, and I connected with this part, you had me. <laughs> You had me at motorcycles, okay? And then you, what you really had me on was when you went to do your laundry and there was that band playing and you sang um, The Cult. And you, oh, my yeah. God. Oh, you were saying, when you said Love Removal Machine, I literally <laughs> dropped, I dropped the book and I went, I went, I go, nobody knows that song is maybe the most kick at when he goes, baby, 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 baby. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Can, can you belt that out for me right now? I mean, you want to be a Oh, gosh. Just, baby, 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 baby. I fell from the sky. <laughs> God, you still got it. You still got it. I tell you what, I mean, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, call me on my bullshit on this, uh, by the way. Okay. Uh, please don't hesitate. But I just felt like, I, I like the groups that you didn't like because you were like, you know, you were singing the cult. You were singing some Van Halen with, you know, Sammy Hager inspired Van Halen. And my, yeah. and you didn't really you didn't really get into into them. You kind of like no offense, but you kind of like uh, maybe I think yeah. I mean, the bangles, a little bit of heart. And I was more like a head banger. So when you said the cult, <laughs> I was like, OK, I am into into this book now. And I love yeah, that it. was that's the crossover. I mean, yeah. I do like. I, I, it wasn't really my thing, I guess, you know, as a as a female growing up in the 80s, a lot of those bands kind of scared me because, <laughs> because of the way that the women were in the videos. I was like, oh, you know, like they're bleach blonde and they've got big boobs and everyone's all sexy, sexy. And I'm just like this little Filipino girl. At, I looked 12 years old when I was 15, you know, like I, <laughs> so I was like, mm, those people will eat me up and chew me out and spit me out, you know, like. <laughs> but, but did it really scare you though? Did it really scare you, scare you? 
It was, you know, it was a little intimidating. You know, the 80s was a, a weird time for women, I think. Yes, I, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Because I remember, I mean, yeah, if you're a guy and I was I, I was so I just remember to me what really <laughs> defined it was that um, uh, you're in love by by rat. To me, that's the video that always to me in, uh, mm. was 80s. Just you struck by lightning. Dun, dun, you're in love. And that, that was 80s. So I guess as a woman, yeah, because it was all about flashing your boobs. And like you said, it was the big <laughs> hair, it was the big hair and the and the yeah. uh, and the and all the the the, the bracelets here and yeah, uh, and the short skirt. So I guess yeah, I didn't look at it that way though. I mean, I really didn't. But why would I? Right. I'm a man. You know what I mean? Exactly. So yeah, yeah. Okay. And I mean, it was even when I was looking for bands they would flat out be like well we really want a guy you know they wanted a guy singer with right. the unless you look like lita ford you know well all right i look more like Susanna hoffs so <laughs> that wasn't gonna work <laughs> yeah i think uh brunettes didn't get enough love i think I no think. we did not get enough love yeah. um there was one female singer in that kind of hard rock genre that i loved and she was kind of pushed back against the oversex thing. And she was a brunette. Her name was Sandy Soraya. Did you ever hear of her? Because you would probably like her if you liked Rat. And um, But she didn't really get that big outside of New Jersey. She was a oh, Jersey girl. No, I did. I, no, and I, and I, I called myself really, really into that music. I was really, mm -hmm. really into music back then. I mean, I would stay in my room and listen to everything. Radio 1990 and, and, uh, and, uh, 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 that, that, uh, that was when videos were big and everything. So I, I call myself knowing everything at the East coast metal sound, but mm -hmm. never her, did she play guitar? What did she do? She's a singer. She had a band. Um, but look her, look it up. The band was called Soraya and the, the female singer was Sandy Soraya. And she's sort of, you know, uh, gotten married and has kids and sort of has disappeared. Um, but, you know, the, there was she put out like two albums and I feel like she was a little ahead of her time um, because right around 1992, 93, 94, a bunch of female rockers started, you know, hitting the scene. Um, like there was, you know, Courtney Love with Hole and there was, you know, even even um, the Lilith Fair, even though it was sort of, you know, hippy dippy trippy music, there was still a lot of females, you know, there was a lot of female rockers doing edgier, edgier music. And I think that the, the labels did not know what to do with her. They wanted her to get breast implants and, and you know, yeah. and she was just like, nah, <laughs> you know, like I did just not me. So I, I want you to check her out. I would love to hear what you think about her. It's uh, Saraya, S-A-R-A-Y-A. <laughs> and she was, yeah. No, go ahead, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I think no, yeah, she was sort of like the person like, because, you know, we all want to be represented. Have you seen like the new Little Mermaid is, is, has a, is, is a person of color, yeah. is a mermaid of color, I should yeah, say. Yeah. And all the little girls of color are going crazy. And I remember feeling that way being, I'm half white, but I'm half Filipino, right. you know, and all the Barbie dolls and stuff had blonde hair. And then I grew up in the eighties and all the sex pots had, you know, blonde hair. And then, you know, Sandy Saray and some of these other singers started coming out and it wasn't all about this look anymore. And I started to feel like, oh, I'm being represented, you know, like seeing somebody like Susanna Hoffs from the Bangles, who's five foot one, which is how tall I am. Yeah. And 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 very flat chested, <laughs> you know. And I thought, oh, see, you can still be short, brunette, and sexy. <laughs> you know? Yes, yeah. Actually, I think she used to go out with Prince. I think I think well, no, she did. Out. Yeah, I believe so. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. See, but you know what? You just made a point that is so true because it representation does help. I mean, mm -hmm. and sometimes if you're a, what sucks is you got to be a heady. You can be ahead of your time, but if it's at the right time being ahead of your time, mm -hmm. and so far ahead of your time that it's like you suffer from it. I feel for those people, you know, mm -hmm. I, mean, I really do. It's like because they like you, you probably like them and a couple of other people, but not enough for her to maintain a musical career. You know? Right. And that's what even Kate Bush you know, do you know Kate Bush? Yes, because I remember yeah. her and Peter Gabriel. Her and Peter Gabriel put a song out together. I used to work at a music store mm -hmm. in Chicago, and it was a uh, Games Without Fears. But I remember her, Kate Bush. Yeah. And I remember that. Yes. And now that they played one of used one of her songs in that show, Stranger Things, and the millennials have pushed her back into the spotlight. But that's there's a great example of someone that was way ahead of her time. I would like listen to her in private because it wasn't cool to like Kate Bush in the 80s. She was just too weird. Yeah. <laughs> so. well, you know, that's what I want to ask you is that, you know, you went through so much in your life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think 
at least for me, me personally, there's always those songs during certain periods or even just that one lyric that just that is always there in your mind. So when you're going through it, I mean, you're going through it. What songs or what bands kind of helped you that mm. you hummed or there was a lyric that you kept going over and over that helped you get through your dark times? You know, um, that song Love Alive by Heart. Okay. Do you know yes. that song? Yes. yes. Ever since I was a baby girl, wanted one thing most in this world was to keep my love, keep my love alive. That song, I feel like that line was probably the thing that, you know, just singing is so therapeutic to begin with, just on a physical level. But yeah, listening to women sing, and it goes back again, representation. And I think that's what I really wanted to do with my book. Right. Uh, a lot of people were like, wow, I can't believe what you put out there with your struggles and, and some of the weird ways that you approached life, <laughs> you know? And a lot of people said, I felt like I was reading my life. You know, a lot of these struggles are things I think we don't talk about enough. It's like people are embarrassed and, you know, even the, all, there is a theme of suicide. People, this is Suicide Awareness Month, by the way, September. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people who are suicidal don't talk about it because they're embarrassed. They don't want people to know that they're that sad, yeah. that they're, they're, they're that low. And a lot of people's reaction to that is, oh, you're just trying to get attention. Well, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody who is suicidal probably needs a little attention and a little love and a little compassion right now. So I just I wanted to take some of the shame away from feeling depression, feeling anxiety, making decisions. You know, we're all trying to do the best. We don't always make the best decisions in our life, especially if you're not in a good state of mind. If you're depressed or anxious, it starts to snowball on itself. But I don't feel like we, we shame this too much. We don't talk about it enough. And so many people go through this. Everybody cries. Everybody grieves. Everybody experiences sadness. Why is it something that we can't talk about? You know, it, well, they do it in their own way. Also, yeah. I mean, everybody does sometimes it, and it and it disguise itself sometimes it, it might come out as as um you know being angry and for no reason like, mm -hmm. why, why they gotta get so angry at you know over yeah. a wrong order at starbucks and maybe he's hurting inside mm -hmm. or you know i mean one of the funny story is one time my brother he's at his football games my mom and my mother uh sister-in-law watching this guy and he was just going at it and my sister-in-law is she's just like you she's real compassionate and she goes you know what that guy just needs a hug and my mom is like, that guy needs somebody to step the shadow him. And so it's like, it's like what you <laughs> said. Maybe he's going through it and he's showing it in a different way. And it's like you said, it's a snowball effect because we all mm -hmm. react to things differently. I mean, it's like when you said, I think when you know, when your mom called you when you were 10 and she said, in the way you just knew something was wrong and you had to go home. I mean, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, I was thinking like sometimes when something like that happens, you just go, okay, you kind of, some people, you know, we just brush it off. And it might, it might be too late where you kind of picked up on that cue and knew, uh oh, something's wrong. And you called her and you went back home. So it's like, mm -hmm. we all deal with that different. I mean, how are you? Mm -hmm. so in, how are you so in tuned at 10 years old? I know that's the thing that freaks me out, even to this day, that I just knew something was off, you know, and it's weird because. I will pick up on cues that other people won't see, but things that are obvious to everyone else sometimes just go right over my head, <laughs> you know? And I don't know if that's because when my, you know, when you're growing up in that kind of trauma, your brain is compensating to deal with certain things. And it's like, okay, this isn't quite as important. So we're not going to, we're not really going to, you know, you don't need to have good social cues. <laughs> like yeah. I'm, I'm, I can be really blind if there's, is it, if I'm in a big social hierarchy, like at a, at a job or at a, in a, like high school, I have a hard time navigating that, but I will pick up on other things that people will miss. Like, like that, like, how did I understand at age 10, something was just off. My mother was, she, I thought she was going to move to another state, you know, and she was suicidal for those that haven't read my book. And I picked up on it and I, I, I was, uh, I intervened with my mother's suicide attempt when I was 10 years old. So yeah, it's just, it's weird because I do think, um, and that's what my next book is going to be about actually neurodivergence, 
we, we look at people with ADHD and, and things like that as a disorder, but the truth is they have other strengths that are making up for what we, what, you know, neurotypicals will see as, as a weakness. So that's no, <laughs> speaking think, of representation. <laughs> no, I think that is great because I mean, it's like, uh, I was going, I, I didn't know how much of the book you want me to, you know, to this diverge yeah. on the air. Cause I, I do want people to read it because like I said, I got, mm. I, I feel like I got tricked in a good way. What do you mean trick? It was like, I just like how you merge that. Cause I, anything with motorcycles, cause I'm like, I'm all for it. And then how you woke. I mean, at one point I was like, when we're we going to get to the motorcycles. And, and then I was like, I like how it it came together like this, and it, but it made sense because mm-hmm. you have you had to do it the way you did it for it to make sense. I mean, mm-hmm. it lets you know it was about family, and let you know and how music played a part in your life. And mm-hmm. I was like, and I'm not gonna lie, man. You know, when it got <laughs> to the point with your mom, you know, it just God damn it, it hit me. It just it. Man, I, I can't really describe it, but it was like that, you know, you saw where the phone call was coming from and you just knew. And I was like, God damn it. And I had to take a little break from reading it, you know, <laughs> and kind of come back. because I, I don't know why, but it just hit me hard. You know what I mean? Because I feel like I was invested in your life. Aww. It's weird because no, I'm reading them going, God damn, you got to get it together, girl. You know, I'm reading it going, get it together, girl. I'm like, you know, and, and, and you bring up points, like you said, that are subliminal, but they make sense that you didn't talk to me. You didn't talk about enough. One was, and it was so subliminal, but it's the truth is how when you go to college, and they set those credit card tables up, you know, uh. and give you those credit cards <laughs> and then they put you in debt and you're in debt for the rest of your life. And like you said, I mean, I, I remember those. When I, was, when I was going to school, I go, I remember those. And I was like, if you, if you don't have a good education with money and you had, mm-hmm. you have some of the greatest quotes ever. Um, uh, oh God, I wrote them down because I wanted you. Uh, okay, I want to know what they are. No, <laughs> you did. It was uh, uh, wherever you go, there you are. And how a person <laughs> yeah. does one thing is how a person does everything. And it was like, oh my God. I mean, they were so just revelatory and I love, and you did it without beating you over the head with it, but it all made sense. And that's what was beautiful about this book. And I, like I said, you feel like you're invested with it because you're going for a while. You let you see how that New Jersey scene was without letting you, see, you know, like you let you see what New Jersey was like in the eighties and how it was going down to the, uh, to the, you know, to the beach or whatever. And, and mm-hmm. Bruce Springsteen kind of, you know, I, like, I yeah. felt that. You said Asbury, I go, Bruce Springsteen. And you mentioned him, I go, oh, Bon Jovi. I remember when you brought that up, I remember going to class when I was going to University of Oklahoma and I'd be damned, Bon Jovi was doing a concert not uh, not too far down the road and he was in a limo and I remember sticking his head up and I go, is that Bon Jovi? I mean, Oklahoma? I mean, but he was, he was doing a concert. So everything you said just resonated so much, man. And I, how hard was it for you to go back to those places mentally? You know, it, it really was therapeutic for me. Um, I had, you know, I've been trying to write this book for a long time, honestly, like probably for 10 years and it's gone through different, um, forms and variations. And it really wasn't until I, I tried, was trying to learn how to motorcycle that I felt like, Ooh, I think I have something here because you know, just to clarify, my book is, it's called the Zen of learning to ride a motorcycle, but it's not really about riding motorcycles. And it's not really about Zen. It's the, the Zen principle is how you do one thing is how you do everything. I have a, a friend of mine who's an author named Jensen Chero. She wrote, um, you are a badass, that series of books. Yes. Um, she was the first one that told me, she's like, doesn't that make sense? And I'm like, it makes sense, but why can't I apply this? You know, I need to, I need to be able to apply this in my life. I understand it but I'm not living it, yes. you know? And when I, I honestly, I spent so much money on my motorcycle. I'm like, I have to learn how to ride this because I'm going to lose. If I sell this motorcycle, I'm going to lose thousands of dollars. Yes. Like it was really, it became that, <laughs> like almost like a shame thing. Like I'm going to be too embarrassed. If I don't learn how to ride this motorcycle, I'm going to be too embarrassed to show my face. So, you know, I had to, I'm like, you can't be panicking when you're learning how to do something that's dangerous. Yes. Fear is one thing. Fear will keep you, you know, in reality, but panic is a distraction. And I'm like, there were times I couldn't, I was like looking at motorcycles on the internet, like pictures of motorcycles. And I just like start panicking, yeah. <laughs> like thinking of riding one. I'm like, I'm never going to learn how to ride like this. And it really started with um, 
you fall down, get back up. If you don't know something, learn. If you, you know, and it was, it was a lot of it was inspired by my cousin's speech at my uncle's funeral when he basically had told her like, and I remember that happening. The whole family was up in arms. Like you're letting a child, right? A girl, a little girl, ride A motorcycle. You know, everyone was mad at my uncle. Cause she, flew, you know, she crashed and flew and he put her right back on. He made her go to the store, made her learn how to fix it. You know? So it was that whole thing about how you do one thing is how you do everything. I had sort of, did a little research, found that it really was rooted in Zen principles. And it wasn't, it wasn't about so much about how to ride a motorcycle, but I realized that those things that I was doing, like, you know, uh, looking in the direction you want to go, not where you don't want to go. That's a big one. I use that every day. Yes. Yes. You know, you, I, I'll find myself going, oh, I don't want blah, blah, blah. I don't want another job where I don't like my boss. Well, you just created a picture of getting a job where you don't like your boss. And I think I use the example my husband, like verbatim, he, he was going on and on. I want a job sitting alone in traffic. And he literally ended up taking a job where he was delivering <laughs> Harley Davidson's in LA yeah. sitting alone in traffic, yeah. like, and going to some of the worst parts of LA to deliver these motorcycles. He was so mad. And I said, well, what do you want to do? And he set out, I, I want to work in the shop with the guys you know, and, and, and chill out and answer the phones and the air conditioner. And, and like literally two days later at a meeting, it was like, his boss was like, Hey, do you like delivering motorcycles? Cause I really kind of need your help in the shop. And he was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah. don't look in the direction you want to go. <laughs> so I am a firm believer in you speak it out. You speak what you want, not what you don't want, you right. know? And I, and I like, what helped you? Like, was there any sp specific books? Because for me, like, I, I like to read all of, I, I, I think in the beginning, Norman Vincent Peale was really inspiring because he had those, you know, those little one quotes that I love that, I, you know, would resonate. And then, when I read this secret, it was, Les, Les Brown helped me a lot because mm -hmm. I, I was living out of my car and I was I was reading his books and it helped me big time. And then the secret, like this, like wow, and that helped me big time. And then my new one is Project Three Six Nine. That's another great one that I love. That it helps you and it and it's proactive. Like you write in like what you, what you want to manifest and your affirmations, and you look at it every day. And you, in the morning, you write what you want three times. Evening, mm -hmm. afternoon, six times, and at nighttime before you go to bed, nine times. And I'll be damned. I mean, I had a miracle happen. I was like, wow. And so, wow. Um, yeah, I, it, it really did. So I'm a firm believer and you speak what you want into the world. So when you say, right. look where you want to go, I mean, that, it, it, that talked to me. Like your whole book talked to me. I'm not just saying it just to kiss your ass. It's just the truth. <laughs> I mean, it's a, no, it, it, <laughs> your, your book is like, it's for the, the everyday person. And mm -hmm. if more women, uh, if it resonates with more women, then so be it. I think it's great. I'm not, a, I mean, I, whatever helps, helps. I don't care who wrote it, you know? But right. coming from your background, I can relate, to, even though you're know, written from your point of view as a girl, as a woman in the 80s, like you said, I, I didn't realize it was scary for you in the 80s. For me, it was a great time. But for you, I mean, it Most was Most don't didn't realize how yeah. scary. And you know, I gotta be honest with you, it was such the norm for us as women. The millennials, I'm Gen X, you're Generation X, right? We're Generation X. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but the millennials, we're, we're, we've a lot of my Gen X girlfriends and I found ourselves going, the millennials going, you mean you were being sexually oppressed and discriminated against and you didn't even realize it? And we're like, yeah, yeah. Because it was so much worse for our mothers. Our mothers couldn't even open up bank accounts without our father's signatures. They could say no women allowed at a job when I was yes. born. So it seemed a little better, but it was still there. There was a, a little bit of a, a, a lot of the sexual assault, like things that we we now talk about, like with Brock Turner and, and the privilege that these men get get away with. That still I mean, get this, away with it. Still yeah, get they away still with get away with it. But it was so much worse. It was so much worse. I mean, I had an incident at college that you read. It. And if you want to know more about it, you can read my book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was too heavy to talk about. But it is yeah. a heavy. It is heavy. <laughs> but I'm glad you put it in there because, yeah, it's like I was, I was like, wow. You know, I I remember yeah. going to parties and I remember, you know, stuff happening. I, and I remember like I'm just places where you go. And I remember a football team being there and I had a friend girl there. And I go, hey, let's go. I just remember going to tell them, hey, let's go. I, yeah, I, it's I, time I, to go. I, it's I felt not... it getting bad. I go, we got to go. And so, 
Yeah, it's like those, it, the, you know, you mentioned the, the micro, I, I call it a little micro thing. Like, it was just the norm. I mean, it was like, mm-hmm. like you said, a you know, bank account. And it's like, okay, that's just how it is. And, you know, and certain, you know, a person of color couldn't do this or that. And it was like, just the way it was. And then slowly, and I'm doing slowly, you know. Yeah. <laughs> slowly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not exactly. It's like, it's taking so damn long. for. That's why, in a way, I was so happy for this Me Too and, and, and the Black Lives Matter Mm-hmm. I, I, to me, all it is 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 the second coming of of the women's liberation yeah. and the civil rights that should have happened back in the day, and we're still fighting the same fight, basically. Right. I mean, it's almost a damn shame in a way, but it is. And the way you put it there was beautiful because, like I said, you don't beat you over the head with it. You show how that's the way it is, and when you're, I think psychiatrist said, "Hey, listen, just don't, you know, like just don't file charges or whatever. Don't." And I was like, I was mad reading yeah. that. Yeah. But that's just how it was back then. You knew that that's just how it was. And you have to, because that happened to me in 1989. And that was the same year. Do you remember that movie, The Accused by Jodie Foster? That was a true story. Yes. That was a true story. And it it was based on an event that happened that same year that I was assaulted in 1989. I mean, this woman went into a bar to get sick because they used to have, remember, cigarette machines? Yes. Yes. Right? She went into the bar just to buy cigarettes from a cigarette vending machine is what they used to have these things back in the day. Right. And um, and and a bunch and six men raped her and she was screaming for help and nobody helped her. And in the public commentary, because this was the first it was a first one of the first cases that was um, broadcast on TV, which is just awful. Because now this poor rape victim was out yeah. there. Yes. And in people's opinions were like, well, sometimes women ask for, it. you know, I think even a lot of women took that attitude back in the day because you don't want to think that you're not in control. You would you want to believe that if something that bad happens to somebody that they must have done something to bring it on themselves. And this is where I feel like women and black men in our society have something in common is there's a lot of this shaming of the victim. A black man gets brutalized by a police officer. Well, he must have done something. He was probably not, you know, complying. He must have been being a jerk. You know, he probably did something wrong. It's just the same sort of attitude towards women that are raped. Well, why was she drunk? Well, is is that a reason for someone to get brutalized? Because they they had too much to drink, you know? So I I would like to see black men and, and women getting together a little more on this. Hey, you know, the blaming the victim thing has got to stop. You know, it's just not going to get better if it doesn't. I've, I've all, you know, I've always said that and championed that, and it's almost, mm-hmm. it's, it's almost in a way, if you if you're not a white straight white male in society, then it's like you know you they kind of victimize you. I mean, in a way, you know, it's like they put the mm-hmm. victim, if you're not a straight white male in the society, and then they have the nerve to bitch about it. You know what I mean? I have the, <laughs> Yeah. Why does everybody hate us? Why does everybody hate you? Why? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, yeah. you're, can we get a list? I mean, you yeah. you get a picture. You get a picture of there's a white Jesus in my church. And we blonde haired, blue eyed white Jesus. And really, like, where'd that come from? <laughs> you know? yeah. And then you're going to complain about a black Ariel mermaid. Come on. <laughs> you didn't have a problem with a white Jesus. You shouldn't have a problem with a black mermaid. Considering the music was Caribbean in the first place. Like, think about the little mermaid. She was in the Caribbean. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, and I, I and by the way, guys, my hair isn't naturally purple either. So, <laughs> no, I, I, I no, of course, of course. I, well, I, 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 but I'm just saying, you know, it's like, what is the problem? <laughs> you know? now, now, you said writing that book was cathartic. OK, but now yes. what, what was the hardest part for you? Like where you like maybe had to step away for a little bit and go, huh, I wonder if I can get through this. Because I mean, like you went like that detail with everything, with the with the suicide, with the with the rape, with the uh, with the everything. You yeah, know? that was hard. That was hard to write about. You know, and I that was hard to write about. It's it's not a memory I like to remember. It's yeah. something I, I tried to forget for years. And, you know, it doesn't really do any good to deny that something happened. Sometimes you don't need to n- remember all the details. You just need to honor, you know, something bad happened to me. And, you know, your body has a memory and it's going to react. And if you start honoring that, that's that's really all you need. You don't have to go into hypnotherapy and remember every last detail. But that was difficult to write about. Writing about my mom was not as hard. 
um, the memory of, of from when I was a child. But I think the last time I saw her, that was a difficult memory to write about. Yeah, hard she was n- not really in a good place at all. Um, the one ex-boyfriend of mine that um, had a suicide attempt. That was a, a little difficult to write about because I didn't want to upset him. <laughs> right. We're still friends. And he was like, I don't even want to read it. I want you to write whatever you want to write. Like I had originally written that chapter and really changed a lot of the details and everything, you know, to make it seem like he was a completely different person. Um, and, but he was like, no, no, no. I want you to tell your truth. So that was a, a, a real gift because even to this day, I'm like, are you sure you're okay? <laughs> like, <laughs> are you sure you're okay with this chat? You know, for a lot of, most of his friends know about that chapter of his life, Yeah. but some of them did it. And we're like, Oh my God, like said something to him. And he's like, it's a, it's a relief because he used to be so ashamed of it. He right. told me it was a relief kind of like most of his friends know about it now, but that was, that's still a little difficult for me because in telling my story, I had to tell so much of his story you know? Right. Yeah. And yeah, but I am just so grateful that he was, he was so supportive. Like, just no, he's like that. He's like, that was, that was something for you that, that period of your life, it, it meant something. And I, I want you to be able to tell your truth. So that it was, that was difficult, but it was so, it was a gift really. Well, that, yeah. I mean, that's how you know you told the truth because, I mean, Pete said, no, I want you to write it the way and him not putting up, a, I mean, you know, complaining about it or say, no, take it out or hit, using his name. I mean, that's when you know you wrote the truth. And I, and I felt mm-hmm. that with everything in there because, I mean, you know, we've been to the same places. I know we talked a little bit on uh, social oh, media. Yeah. I was like, we've been to the same places. So, like, you laid that groundwork and it was so vivid for me reading that and one thing I wanted to get to now is that like here's what I felt and I just felt like in that healing process I felt like that maybe you didn't get enough credit to and I felt maybe because I said correct me if I'm wrong well, I think music and I think you did, I, I, even though you gave a little credit I think yoga probably gave a, a little bit more of a healing because I mean I went and I took yoga at uh, the Marina Del Rey Athletic Club a couple of times and I was like eh, <laughs> What's this yoga shit, right? And then, <laughs> and I don't know where I don't know where it was, but it started. It started like okay, then it okay. I started, and then I did a hot yoga class, and that was one of those wow moments. Where I was like, this is it. I mean, I I, I felt like I sweated out everything, and I just felt like the bad came out, you know, whatever. And I mean, that was one of those wow. Everything I, you know, how people go, oh my god, this is amazing. And you go, really? That was, but yeah, this really, really was, really, yeah. But it, it really was, is amazing. But Did yoga, you ever go to the Santa Monica Power Yoga? No, I, that I, saved my life because that was uh, Brian Kess, the um, yoga teacher. It was a donation basis only. And there were times that I was basically, you know, digging up change in the couch and putting that in the donation box, you know, and then I'd put $40 in if I was making good money at one time. But it, it enabled me to have a consistent practice that wasn't interrupted by finances <laughs> you know yeah. i think that's a really hard thing to sometimes to stay you know if you're not the kind of person that's just going to get up and start running if you need that motivation of a class or other people around so that was that was life saving for me i mean he doesn't have those classes but i know a bunch of his students have um studios in santa monica now and i think they do have those kind of classes still so um yeah yeah yoga well, that was a thing. Um, yoga, cannabis, and Burning Man probably deserve their own book. That will be my third one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, because there is other, you know, that's a kind of, you know, becoming a psychiatric nurse. I was, you know, working in a cannabis dispensary and then I became a psychiatric nurse. And I'm, I'm so disappointed in Western medicine. You know, I'm so disappointed in Western medicine right now. I don't even know. I'm not working at a nursing job at currently. Um, my last job, even though they made $4 billion in revenue last year, laid me off for the budget. It was probably <laughs> a blessing because yeah. I really was not feeling good about some of the things that I had to do at this particular nursing job. And um, as far as it just, I didn't feel like, you know, I'm dealing with patients who were in uh, dealing with substance abuse issues. And I felt like 
they wanted me to be more punitive than supportive. It, that was just how the role was. It was more of a case management than a um, than an actual bedside nursing type of role. And that's not why I became a nurse. <laughs> I didn't become a nurse to be somebody's parole officer. And to, you know, if they need to get sober, they need to get sober. And there's more than one way to do it. And by the way, after I left that job, I found out a huge piece of information about AA meetings, which is that the founder of AA had a, an LSD trip and credits that to getting him sober. The meetings just kept him sober, but they weren't what got him sober. That's a huge piece of missing information. So you're asking these people to follow this guy's program, but you're, you're not, you're leaving out a big part of the program. <laughs> that was the LSD part. Yeah. There's a, there's a, an excellent documentary on Netflix called how to change your mind. And it's about the, the, the history of a lot of psychedelics and, and the current research. And, you know, that's where I would like to see mental health go in what, that direction. Wasn't what, 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 the FBI involved in it or, or the government involved in well, like, the D, the Yeah. The D, yeah. The government was involved. That's a weird story. Um, that's a whole weird story. There, there's another documentary on Netflix. I do yeah. not work for Netflix, by the way, but there's a documentary on like Netflix called Wormwood about that whole, that, that urban myth about, oh, so they were doing experiments with LSD and the FBI and somebody had a flashback and jumped out a window. It turned out nobody jumped out a window. Somebody was assassinated because they had a trip on LSD and didn't want to make chemical warfare anymore. And was like, just let me out. Like, let me out of this, like, kind of like the mafia, you know, didn't want to work for the FBI or CIA or whatever it was. But anyway, my, my memory for details isn't that great, but that, that, yeah. (laughs) But now they're looking at MDMA for PTSD for soldiers, you know, I mean, cannabis has, I, I, I've seen it save people from opiate addiction, you know what? I was going to say that because I had both my hips replaced, right? And my one, and the only fear I ever had, I asked the doctor. I said, "Listen, man, if you're going to put me in the opioids, you know, I'm, I'm worried about being addicted." And I just think that, I mean, luckily I didn't come close. But I will say this: I had no pain from the actual hip surgery, but the opioids put me in a bad mood. I was and I, and I had bad dreams. I was in a negative state, and that's just not mm. me. You can tell them I'm, I'm nothing but a sweetheart. So I was yeah. at, I, was, I was in a bad mood, and and once I went in to get my first checkup, I, it, ha- it just so happened I ran a, a painkillers that day, my opioids that day, and the doctor said, "Hey, you're good. You're on the right. You know, you're on the right path. Do you want to refill?" And I go, "No." And I did it without the painkiller, and I felt so much better just mentally. And I just mm-hmm. think that we, we, you know, we. I almost feel bad because you almost point the finger, especially, you know, I live I'm here in the Midwest and, you know, we have a big opioid crisis here. And oh, so yeah. I just want to point the finger at the, like, hey, man, get it together. But, you know, realize, hey, man, sometimes the pusher, <laughs> it's the government or it's the doctor. And I just feel like when I'm reading your when I was reading your book and you were talking about it, it seemed like they were so quick to get put you on drugs and actually. Yes. What was wrong? They were right. They, like they're like, All right, uh, take this. This is what's wrong with you. And and the end, yes. you got a screw drop for so many years. I really did. And, it and really I- did. Yeah, I was on a, a medication that really made me hyper. And I've seen it since. And, you know, when I became a nurse, a psych nurse, and I would see patients on this partic- that particular drug that I talk about in my book, um, I, I would say to my, my, my coworkers, look at this. This is how this drug makes them act. Or they would say they're acting really weird, not manic, kind of like they call it gamey when somebody's being shady, like they think they're going to put something over on the nurses, you know. Um, And I'd say, are they on such and such drug? And they'd be like, how did you know that? I'm like, because everyone acts like that on that drug. I swear, (laughs) like right down to, you know, I had um, married my boyfriend who was from Brazil. We only were dating for two months because I was so impulsive on this drug, literally years after, you know, I went off this drug, a good friend of mine was going through a bad breakup and he's, he started, his doctor put him on that drug. I said, be really careful. I said, it really does get you out of that funk immediately. I go, but in six to 12 months, if you don't feel like yourself, you need to get off of it. And it was funny because he freaking married his boyfriend from South America. And I'm like, is this, this is like a specific (laughs) 
side effect of this drug, you feel compelled to marry someone in, from South America so they can get a green card, you know. And one of the really weird, this is actually in medical journals. Um, this drug has been known to cause people to become kleptomaniacs. They start shoplifting. And then when they go off the drug, they they, they urge to shoplift stops. So this is, you know, when there's there's really no incentive for anyone to study this particular drug and say, let's not use it anymore because somebody's going to lose money. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. You're going to spend money to lose more money. Basically, that's how that's how the free market pharmaceutical, you know, this, I, this is why I really feel like we need something a little more balanced. It can't just be a free market healthcare and it can't just be government healthcare. There has to be both choices. So they are kind of keeping each other in line. You know what I mean? Oh my God. Yes. Sense? Yes. <laughs> because you know, we, we, we've, we've demonized marijuana and cannabis. Now, listen, I, I, you know, I never did it back in the day because for one, we had the eighties, we were told just say no, only losers smoke that stuff. That's what I was taught. You were too. Probably, well, my, right? yeah, my, my dad was like, that's dope. <laughs> Stay off that dope. And plus I wanted yeah. to go, I wanted to go to the <laughs> Olympics and wrestling and it's not. And so it was like, that was it. But you know, the demonizing of marijuana actually started back in the forties when they told oh, yeah. a jazz music, you know, they told, Hey, white women want to have sex with the jazz musicians. So they yeah, go, yeah. Oh, Will make this bad, you know. Marijuana is bad, and that's where that's where that came from. And then yeah. you know, and then it snowballed. And oh my god! Even before that, it was yeah. just hey, you know, it, there was it was it was kind of like in even in the eighteen hundreds back in California, believe it or not, there was sort of this oh those immigrants, those people from Mexico, and those Indians and those black people are taking our jobs, so they illegalize marijuana because that's what they all smoke. You're basically yeah. Ill illegalizing the existence of, of two cultures. We, Easily. Got, we got Karen <laughs> back in the day. We got Karen. Yeah, back yeah. We have Karen. Day. Karen has been around. <laughs> she's been around since the, the beginning of time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she's the reason we can't get marijuana legalized on yeah, a federal level. Yeah, well, Karen's got to ruin it for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> she's going to speak to the manager everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's so, so true. true. Because I, I hate that because I really feel that that. You know, like, I, I can't say, I don't want to say like I'm, you know, being conceited, but it's like, once I felt like I left Oklahoma and I start reading things on my own and start expanding out and I just, I felt like I, oh, it, I start coming in knowledge from the outside, it, you know, back then it's an alternative, but it's like, like the medicine, like you said, you know, I hate the, mm -hmm. the medical industry now, like I get it now because all I want to do is solve things with a pill. You know, mm -hmm. like, do doctors even doctor anymore? I mean, they're, they're not hurt. allowed. I was actually, I was at Burning Man with a 75 year old. He used to be a family practice doctor yeah. in like the 60s and 70s and 80s. And he said, you know, around the year 2000, suddenly he felt like he was being micromanaged yeah. by um, any, any, any reimbursement entity. So like health insurance companies and um, like Medicare, Medi-Cal. So if you're not following these really strict rules, you're not going to get paid, basically. Yes. And, you know, it became to the point where it's like they can't even individualize treatment. Like my husband, you know, he, my husband is fully vaccinated. He's got the COVID vaccine. He's not an anti-vaxxer, but he ended up in the hospital back in the 90s. He got the flu shot and had like almost it was like 103.8 fever. Like this is life threatening. Yes. And his doctor said to him be very careful about what vaccines you get in the future because you're obviously very sensitive. So, you know, fast forward 20 years later, that same doctor that told him not to get the flu shot is asking, do you want the flu shot this year? And he's like, doctor, you're the one who told me not to get it 20 years ago when I was in the hospital. He's like, I know, but they make me ask you. <laughs> you wow. <know? laughs> so, wow. so, you know, it's, it's, you know, and the same thing that this doctor that I met at Burning Man was telling me, he's like, yeah, I finally retired because it's like, they're, you know, why are you prescribing this? And why are you prescribing that? Like, I'm no longer trusted to make my own decisions as a physician. Why isn't that person getting this vaccine? Why isn't that? I had another friend that left for the same, she's, she switched from neonatal nursing to OR nursing because, you know, a lot of when, when she was talking about the hep B vaccine, um, it's she would tell them, oh, if you want to go and get it from your from your doctor, because they give them so many vaccines, right. you know, at once. She's like, yeah. if you don't want to get this one, it's not an airborne disease. It's only blood borne, which is true. Um, so if you you and your husband don't have hep B and nobody taking care of the baby has hep B that and the exposure is minimal. Maybe you want to go get that one at your 
primary care doctor. She started getting in trouble for, for saying that. And she's like, I'm not a, a, a drug salesperson here. I, I'm reading the peer reviewed, what is true to the parents, letting them make their own decision for themselves, because that's what we should be doing. You yes. know, so she's like, ended up becoming an OR nurse because she's like, I don't, you know, I didn't, I felt like I was getting pressured to pressure parents into doing things that they may, weren't necessarily comfortable with and wanted to talk to their personal doctors about you know, yeah. their personal pre- pediatrician. She just felt that that was, they were asking her to overstep in a way. So I, I know there's a lot of issues, uh, you know, with modern healthcare um, that are real like that, where if you don't fit in the box, like heaven forbid, you're allergic to a certain kind of antibiotic, you're going to have to go find some doctor, some, some obscure doctor somewhere that doesn't take insurance in order to get treated. <laughs> you know? and, and you might be, and you might be better off in a way you might find some yeah. other things that quote unquote alternative medicine and you might have, have you juicing or maybe have you, like I said, maybe, and it sounds weird, but have a hot yoga class and, and maybe yeah. you put those toxins out and get those mm-hmm. toxins out of your body and you go, you know what? I feel better. I, I feel better than being in a hospital or just taking a pill and, you know, and hoping that, you know, fixes the problem. Oh, and- yeah. And what do, what do we do to people? Like, look at poor Britney Spears. If people are suicidal or depressed and you put them on an involuntary hold. I That was one of my last jobs. I was um, going around Los Angeles ERs and evaluating psych patients for 5150 holds. And, you know, you would always try to get <laughs> try to put the ones on the hold that you actually knew they really wanted help. Yeah. You know, um, and, and the, the, the sad thing is the ones that don't want help are usually saying the things that will get them put on a hold. And the ones that want the help, they don't sound like the, the verbiage, you know, like I would almost have to be like, hey, this person really wants help and have to try to manipulate it so I could get them on a hold just so they could yeah. get help. Even yeah. though they were there was like they were voluntarily going on an involuntary hold yeah. because they were just desperate for help. <laughs> you yeah. know? I get you. <laughs> So like, when did you feel like, you know, coming through everything and, you know, being diagnosed with, you know, you, you had the problems this and that, but when did you feel like you kind of start turning the corner for the better for in the long run? Cause I mean, there were periods, you know, like yeah. you said, periods of like, okay, I'm good. And then feel like, realize, okay, I'm not. But when did you realize like, okay, I think I've turned the corner on this and now I can come, I want to come back and help. Was, was uh, there a certain, was there a certain like light bulb or was it just over? There, there, you know, I think it probably was when I was working. And again, like I had written initially written a much longer chapter about um, medical cannabis in my experience working with cannabis patients. Mm-hmm. And one of my uh, friends slash editors was like, this needs its own book. You know, this is, this is, this chapter is almost a distraction because there's so much you could say about this. So I kind of glossed over it. But there was a time when I was I was I was there and I sort of really honestly, I think it probably was the major was when I was sitting on the floor in that psych ward that one day. And I said, this is ridiculous. I'm I've become my mother because I'm trying to fit in with what my society is telling me. I should like these drugs. Good. Those drugs. bad. This is how you get mentally healthy. Not like this. You don't smoke pot and go to Burning Man to get mentally healthy. But honestly, that's way more ther- therapeutic than anything that I've ever dealt with <laughs> in a hospital. You yeah. know, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, that that there was this I didn't want to, like I was already the daughter of a schizophrenic. You know, there's already this feeling of, you know, being like half a minority. So like the Filipino community is like, you don't look, you're not Filipino. And then being half white and the white community being, well, you kind of look foreign, you know, like right. just uh, never feeling like I fit in anywhere. And then sort of being like, why am I even trying to fit in? Who cares? I'm just going to go, I'm just going to go get, find a medical marijuana doctor and go get medical marijuana. There was like, just kind of this point where it was like, your healing is so personal and it has to be what works for you. And, you know, and I still struggle with it. Don't get me wrong. I still struggle with what society tells me a proper woman is supposed to behave like, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, like, like, what, wait, what, wait, though, like, what do you do? Like the, like, you, Oh, you like, flash you're 50. <laughs> well, like I, I suddenly got my motorcycle license at age 50. You it's know, right. I, hey, it didn't matter. Good for you. I decided to dye my hair purple at age 52. Like, so, you know, it's just, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, growing up in Oklahoma, I grew up in New Jersey. So everything east of the Rockies is very like, what will the neighbors think? It's that kind of right. And then you go to California and you're like, holy crap, no one gives a shit. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody gives a shit. <laughs> just stay off my lawn. That's all. Just stay off yeah. my lawn. Yeah. Stay off my lawn. Yeah. <laughs> but um, do you, you said that you were in California around the same time I was. Oh my God. I mean, everything you, your book, I was like, yeah, I mean, you mentioned Torrance and I played hockey at Charles Wilson Park. I played uh, <laughs> roller hockey there. And I, you know, Manhattan Beach, I lived in Manhattan Beach for a brief period. And I, I was a, a, um, I was a bouncer at the Kettle restaurant hey. on the weekends. Here's how easy it was. Okay. We get there before the shift started. They would feed us. Okay. And then we worked from like about 1.30 until about 3.30 in the morning. And then they give us uh, money after the shift and they give us another shift uh, meal. And it was easy. And if a fight broke out, the cop shop was only two blocks away. We right, just, right. It was the easy. It was the greatest job ever. I, and the only time a fight broke out was the weekend I had to leave. So I think, oh, you should have been there last week. It got crazy. And I go, really? But it was great. That was back then. I was eating like a. I I eat mean, eggs Benedict before the before their shift started and the eggs Benedict after the shift started. Oh my god! <laughs> I got yeah, and it's a diner. It's not really a bar. So I get, but I guess drunk people would come there to eat because it's open twenty four hours. Yes, and so we they had needed- Yeah, and the cops would always jump the line and and come in. I hated those cops. I, I really they they, they always <laughs> racially profile me. They always they pull me up for no reason. I hated Aww. them. But, but beside the fact though, beside the fact, yeah. So we spent time in Manhattan Beach together. I mean, not together together, but right. uh, and then Torrance. So. So everything you I was like, oh my God, how, our past must have crossed and we didn't even know it. We were like, I probably start- ate. I probably ate at the kettle in the middle of the night when you were a bouncer and didn't even know it. And you were like, who is that black guy that bounces? Oh my God, I should talk to him. Oh well. And you're probably singing some rock and roll song and then you know, and our and our and then, but yeah. now but now here we are. But now here we are. What year were you in man? Because it was I, I tell you, I found it kind of boring because it was so white. It was so white in the early 2000s in Manhattan Beach. It seems a little bit there. more diversified now. You know, I had I had different there were different ethnic, you know, there were some black people and some Hispanic people living in my building in Manhattan Beach right before I left. But it was in the early 2000s. It was like, oh, my God, I want to go back to Venice because I'm bored. I mean, I don't like the trash in Venice, but this is boring. <laughs> it was like it was like a black. It was me and another black dude. That's all I can remember. That was it. <laughs> yeah, that was it. It was just two of us. And whenever yep, one, I, whenever I left, it was up to him. He goes, man, you need to get back in town soon. I'm the only one. Yeah. Here. I said, OK, so I'd come back. But honestly, yeah, it was not very much diversity, but. I just remember, yeah, it was like that. I mean, you know, you go to places and it was like, ah, but I was so used to dealing with it that it was nothing new to me. You know what I mean? It, it really right. wasn't. So, but I, but I, I was there from about 90, 98 to 2005. Oh, okay. Yeah. We were there at the same time. Cause I was there from nine, like, well, I was in Venice in 99 and then I moved to Manhattan beach, I think in 2000 or 2000, right before, I think I moved there the January before nine 11. Is when I was in Manhattan Beach. I remember yeah. being there for not, and, but, and, and, this yeah. is how, and this is how it all comes full circle in this. I remember uh, thinking, okay, I, I kind of got to leave California. And I remember looking at motorcycles going, you know what? If I want a motorcycle, I, I can't live in California because I can't afford it. And then when I decided to leave California, I moved to Indiana and I'd be damn. A year later, I got a motorcycle and that's when the addiction started. And now. Oh, like, yeah. So, so what, what are you riding? What do you ride? We didn't get to talk about motorcycles. We should talk about motorcycles. Yeah, I, I, uh, <laughs> I got a 2000, uh, 2016 uh, uh, Ducati Multistrada Pike Speed. Ooh, so, yeah. nice. So, yeah. So I, I like to uh, go sport touring, you know, like I'm going to see my parents uh, tomorrow. So I'm going to put my bag on the back and just go down and see about a 10 hour drive. Go down and see them. Wow. Yeah. I go down for the weekend, come back 10 hours. And I've, I've ridden from here to Sacramento, from here to Tucson. So, yeah, man, it's nothing for me to just put some bags on the bike and put some bags on that bitch and then just ride. And that's what I did, you know? <laughs> yeah, I just got a new motorcycle that I haven't ridden yet because it's it's about seven years old and it, it still has bike? all the dirt bike. It's no, I got a I got a Honda CTX 700 in. No, are you serious? I know about the dirt bike. I know about the electric bike. When did you get the when you get the when you get the Honda? I haven't really done any videos yet because I haven't written it yet. I got it. I actually sold the KX 
because I haven't ridden my dirt bike in two years. And I wow. finally told my husband, I said, I haven't ridden this in two years. I really, really, really want because I have, you know, I have the electric bike. Right. And the range anxiety thing right now is real because they're just especially I just moved outside of Tahoe. Right. There just aren't enough chargers out here to go long distance rides in right. L.A. No problem. I could ride around forever. There's chargers everywhere, but right. not so much here. So I really want, I've really wanted this bike. <laughs> so I sold the KX. I found this bike and I basically almost didn't even swap. I use a little money for my book royalties. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not paying bills with my book royalties <laughs> with my first yeah. royalty check. Yeah. I bought another motorcycle. So yeah, I got the Honda, um, but I'm taking it in next week to get new tires and, get the fluids flushed and uh, the, the fork seals were leaking. So I, I don't want to ride it until I get up. And that's a, the thing. That's the thing I loved about my electric. Like there's so few moving parts on the electric motorcycle. You could smash that thing into the ground, you know, and the only thing you might do is break your blinker, blinker light <laughs> like this. I'm like, I can't drop this bike. There's too many. I'm like looking, there's so many little gears and little moving parts and little tiny wires everywhere on this no. gas bike. I love how you I love how you combine that riding with the motorcycle with dealing with your issues. I thought that was beautiful. Because and, and I wonder why. I mean, you're a five one, you're a little one, but my roommate is the same size. She's the same size as you. And that's why you shouldn't have gotten rid of the dirt bike. Because you can you have trails up in Northern California. And trails, trail riding is so <laughs> much fun. Getting dirty. I might get another dirt dirt bike. I just don't know. That was that was like that bike is like a little rabid chihuahua. Yeah, it's a tiny little bike, but it's so aggressive. Like you have to be so aggressive on the throttle when you're shifting the gears and you're just like, like, I mean, it's just like a little monster. So I might, I don't know, like when I pay off the electric, maybe I'll get a dual sport electric. No, hear me out. Get Get a Ducati Scrambler. Get a oh, I love those. Get a Ducati Scrambler. They'll lower your seat. They'll lower it for you. And I'm telling you something. Yeah. It's the perfect bike for you. Trust me when I say get a Ducati Scrambler. It's all, and I it's love all. those. And I like the Triumph. Uh, what is it? The, the, the Speed Twin. That yeah. one is a good size for yeah, me, Ducati too. Scrambler. I wouldn't do you wrong like that, Leslie. <laughs> Ducati Scrambler. That's, that's what you get. I, I, I'm going to have to get another dirt bike at some point. But I was like, you know, there's Alita. You know who the Alitas are? You ever hear of the Alitas? Uh, I didn't know about it until I, I saw your videos. And I was like, what are the leaders? Yeah, there, it's a, it's just a motorcycle collective of women. It's just a bunch of women who are like, if you want to ride with us, come ride with us. It's not like a club or a gang or anything. It's you just, just follow them on social media and show up at the at the rides. But it's it's just so nice because like it's like an, it's an, it it's sort of just like the instant community. There's pretty much a chapter in every city across it, all over the globe. I think I'm not sure where they started. I thought they started out of Italy. I don't know if they started there, but I know they have chapters like in the Philippines everywhere. Well, so, I think it's beautiful. I think it's what women yeah. need. I, I really think women need like that just to show that that camaraderie and something yeah. like motorcycle. I think it helped because yeah. I mean, motorcycling is great. It really is. A, it's a, uh-huh. it's a, such a giving community and they'll help you and everything. But man, I really think it helps when it, like it's all women group together because it's just that, that bonding women need. I really right. think, so. and that's not a bad thing. It's like a lot of women together riding. It's great because you guys have that right. thing that you guys have that, you know, hey, maybe, you know, just us together riding or hey, I got an issue that maybe, you know, the guys wouldn't want to hear about or talk about. But exactly. They, they, well, really, it was the women that because guys can be a little jerky, like, you know, oh, oh, you're going to get killed. You're on a motorcycle doesn't make any sound and you can't even get both feet down. You shouldn't be riding like this is this is this is the encouragement that yeah. I would get from men, you know, yeah. and then I'm watching. Um, have you watched Doodle on a motorcycle on YouTube? She is no. like my favorite YouTuber, this girl doodle on a motorcycle. And she started talking. I didn't even know that motorcycles had manual transmissions. She's like, she's like, she had so little automotive and motorcycle. There was nothing and no one in her family knew anything about even changing the oil on the car. And she just decided she wanted to learn how to ride. She took the class one weekend. She didn't think she was going to keep going, but listening to her and her humility and, you know, she would be videotaping herself when she drop her bike, you know, and would put it out there and it would just make me be like, you know what? <laughs> well, listen, I have an episode coming out, hopefully in a couple of days. Uh, it's, it's, got a, it's a woman named uh, Bike. Uh, she named Grace McDonald. She goes by Bike Hedonia. She's, uh, she used to be a lawyer in Australia 
And she decided to chuck it all. She got on a motorcycle and she's literally riding around the world. And That's she so ran, awesome. She rode through Australia and now she's in Thailand and she got a little uh, like an adventure bike uh, group that uh, they can ride and, and that's how she pays for stuff and and uh, I interviewed her yeah she literally just said the hell with everything I want to be happy she was a lawyer <laughs> oh, and she that's goes, awesome I'm done with it so yeah I try to get stories like that and I think it's great and I also don't think enough credit goes to your uncle who like you said at that you know the funeral and you know go, growing up and back in the day they looked at him how can you let your daughter ride and she crashed but he was kind of a trendsetter. I mean, he was kind of like a, a pioneer yeah. in the sense of he let your daughter see, I mean, had his daughter see what independence is like for a woman. Yeah. And part of those life lessons like, hey. Anyway, it was it was a little hard for him, too, though, because he's this traditional Catholic Filipino dude born in the late 30s, early 40s. I'm not sure. But, you know, he's a boomer. And, you know, wants to be I, I could see my father and my uncle both really wanted to be these you know, progressive kind of feminist dudes, but they were still very ingrained with this. So, so there was this weird, my, my poor cousins had to yell, change the oil, but you better get married before you get ugly. Kind of like, <laughs> you know, like the change the, your own yeah. oil and ride a motorcycle yeah. is so progressive. And then make sure you get married before you get ugly is like, <laughs> what? What <laughs> you know, like well, he was teaching you to be superwoman. That's a superwoman. If a woman can change wanted, her oil and ride a motorcycle, be bond, bond girls. That's what I said. Yes, James I thought that bond was girls. great. Yeah, he loved James Bond. My cousin's like, I can't believe he used to let us watch. We're like watching Octopussy. You know, we're like ten years old. Like, like <laughs> <laughs> you know. So sometimes they was like, oh, but I did want to circle back. So yes, the reason I ended up buying a gas bike with yeah. the Honda CTX is because. Um, this new new group of Galitas that I've joined out here in the Tahoe area, they're going on rides. They're like 85, 90 miles round trip. And then you don't want to be that person that's like, hey, can we stop for coffee by this charger here? <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> so, yeah. So circling back to the Galitas. Yeah. It's a, it's a great community for women, for sure. <laughs> I, I love that. I mean, I really, I think, like I guess I think it's great for women just to ride, period. I think it's awesome. And I, how did you, a real quick, like, before we get out of here, is that how did you decide to, uh, I combine those two and had that be the basic, the theme of the book, but also talk about the mental health issues and what you went through growing up. I, I think it was just when I, you know, when I started becoming conscious of the habits I wanted to develop on the motorcycle. And I was just like, if I apply these to my life, they work for that too. You know, um, yeah. That's yeah, that was that was it. And I remember calling up one of my friends and thinking, oh, my God, I came up with these 10 habits that I'm practicing on the motorcycle. But they they actually relate to my life. And I can think of a like story that would match each part of my life, you know, that was sort of like an analogy for falling down and getting back up or, you know, like like I said, I ended up in the psych ward sitting on the bathroom floor suicidal because I spent so much of my life. I didn't want to end up like my schizophrenic mother, yeah. my schizophrenic suicidal mother. Yeah. And by focusing on what I didn't want, I ended up becoming what I didn't want to be. You know, I had a motorcycle crash just recently where I was not looking in the direction I wanted to go. I'm, you know, I was used, I got used to, I learned how to ride in LA, which is a crazy place to learn how to ride mm -hmm. motorcycles. Yes. Right. Yes. But you know, there's tons of stop signs and parking lots and things to make U-turns in. So out here, it was different. There's a, I was looking at the ditch and thinking, don't ride into the ditch. And what happened? I rode into the ditch. <laughs> <laughs> I rode into the, the bike stopped and I <laughs> went over and I was wearing all my gear. So nothing happened. And except I was embarrassed for myself. You know, we like, always we get embarrassed, Leslie. I mean, if you fall down, you get back up. Get back up. What kind of lessons would you like people to learn from reading your book? And now that you're here, people can you know see the real you instead of have, you know besides the, read the book. Like what like lessons before we get out of here? Like what would you like to say to anybody? I think um, I just want people to know that they're not alone. Everybody goes through weird times. Everyone makes mistakes. Everyone falls down. You know, it, it's. There's so many motorcycles for sale that have one little scratch on them and very few miles. And you know that that person dropped that motorcycle once and they gave up. 
You know, like imagine when you were a child, if you were learning how to walk and the first time you fell on your face, you were like, all right, I'm done. I'm going to stay here. Yeah. So I just, that's maybe the lesson is it's never too late. I'm constantly falling down and picking myself back up. That's, and that's what makes yeah. you, yeah. that's what makes yeah, you. There's yeah. no, like when you talk about when you turn the corner, you know, I like to say, yeah, I turned the corner and then there's another corner. There's always another corner to turn, you know? Yeah. Um, there's never really that like, yay, here I am. I've arrived. It's my life is great. It's yeah. that's yeah. If, if there's anything to take away, then it would be that you just got to enjoy those little tiny moments because there is always something around the corner and you're always going to have to pick yourself back up. <laughs> that, that's beautiful. beautiful. I mean, I mean, it from the bottom of my heart, like I said, Aww. I loved it. It drew, drew me in. Like it, I think the, the motorcycles, obviously, but then when you mentioned the cult, I was like, all right, I'm all in now. I'm all in. When you start yeah. listening to groups that I grew up with, what are you listening to now? What are you listening to now? Oh, what am I listening to now? Um, actually, you know, when, when Kate Bush got back on the charts, I kind of revisited her recently. I started uh-huh. listening to her again. Uh-huh. Um, but I just, what am I listening to? That's a good question. I think I, I kind of went back to some of my old music from the nineties recently, actually kind of feeling like after re- after writing my book, I'm like, yeah, I kind of want to listen to some of this, you know, and yeah. kind of went back and was pulling out my old heart and, and bangles and <laughs> And that music, but I love like electronic music too. Yes, you know? know why? Because you always in a good mood. And and what <laughs> did it for me was living in an apartment in Linux. You know how you know where Linux is, right? Next oh yeah, to- I know where Linux okay. is. I was living in Linux. I was one of the few people that spoke uh, English in that apartment complex. <laughs> and I remember <laughs> I bought this. I bought this uh, uh, the shower head from Target. I remember that it was the greatest shower head ever. I was like, oh my god! And I remember listening to Gold Frap. Um, oh uh, yeah, I'm number like, one, cause you're my number one. And I was like, and that song just resonated. And ever since then, I was a big EDM fan. People make mm. fun of it, but you all, you're always in a good mood. It, it's never, yeah. a mean, there's never a mean EDM song. So no, so, no, that's what my friends are into. Um, my the group of people that I hung out with in in Los Angeles when I was living there are responsible for um, Charlie the Unicorn at yeah. Burning Man, if you've ever seen that. It's a big art car that's shaped like a unicorn. It blows yeah. fire out of its yeah. its horn, but yeah. Um, I, you know, and I also, I really love Massive Attack and Thievery Corporation. Yeah. Disturbing that sometimes I hear Th- Thievery Corporation in the grocery store now. Yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> 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 EDM has turned the corner. E- EDM yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like you're listening to it. It's in the, you're in Whole Foods Market and you're like, yeah. And LA has got this strange love affair with um, uh, Depeche Mode. Like, I swear you'll be listening to the Beatles and, the, the Beach Boys, and then all of a sudden some weird Depeche Mode song just comes on in the mix. I'm like, but you ask your L.A. friends, they'll tell you. It's, I will do it's that. Bizarre. When I get to L.A., I will do that. <laughs> Leslie Reyes, it has been nothing short of a pleasure to talk to you. If you guys get a chance, I got this off, I think, Amazon. Get yeah. the, book, the Zen of Learning to Ride a Motorcycle, and it's, it's so much deeper than that. Uh, if you're going through yeah. it, and read it you're not alone like she just said there's always somebody there for you yeah thank you it's so- not it is not about how to ride a motorcycle and it is yes. not a book about zen philosophy i do want to make that clear because the only three star reviews i got were like oh i thought it was going to be more about zen or oh i thought it was going to be more of an instruction manual i mean yeah. it's pretty the description if you read it it's pretty clear what the book is about yeah. but i just wanted to let y'all know that no right I- it is it's really more of an analogy on on recovering from struggle. And if you do it, anybody can do it. Like I said, she's been through it and look at her now. <laughs> just beautiful and radiant. But of course, she's the Gemini. Anyway, listen, we got <laughs> we got to get out of here. Leslie we Reyes, do, I know. thank you so much. And they can, <laughs> they can contact you at, what's your Instagram? It's at Lola Leslie 66 Lola Leslie 66 Leslie Reyes, mwah. thank you so much, fellow Gemini. Thank you for I appreciate having me. That. Thank you. Thank you guys <laughs> for watching Tales from a Gemini. I'm BT, and you know how I say it about this time. You know the word, pain.